Proverbs 18. This is the Proverbs and Prophecy series. We cover a chapter in Proverbs. We cover a chapter in, in Revelation. And then I think tonight we'll go a few other places. A lot of our focus tonight, I think, can be drawn out of Proverbs 18, and verse 1. Through desire a man, having separated himself, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. We talked about in our introduction the power of desire and the danger of desire. I and mean, it's really true what I was just telling the kids, that even if you desire something good, watch out for it, right? I try to give an example of you desire to be a missionary. Well, if you don't pray about if you're supposed to be a missionary or where to be a missionary, you're going to make mistakes. If you desire to reach your family, you can say, you know, I really want to make sure my, my aunt knows the Savior, so I'm going to move across the country, move in with my aunt, and minister to her. Well, it's a really good thing. It's a good desire, but you've got to pray about those decisions anyways, right? And then, of course, you go to the easy side of desires just being possessions you can gain, wealth, riches, or things, and that desire is completely blinding and deceiving as well. And it's on that last point that I think will drive our conversation tonight. Our whole world is chasing after riches and possessions. That's their drive. They desire to build wealth and treasures in this earth. And that is not a Christian mindset in any way, shape, or form. Um, whether you're saved or unsaved, that's a bad frame of mind to have the dollar bill as your uh, North Star. It's, that's what you're chasing after. It says, through desire, a man having separated himself. Seeketh and intermeddleth. So, I think you can look at this a few different ways. You can preach it many different ways. But desire separates you from God's will. <laughs> separates himself. Separates himself from God. You can separate yourself from God's people. From God's will. From where God wants you to be. And then you start seeking things that are not God's will and God's place for you. And then that intermeddling with all wisdom. That's when you're messing up what sound wisdom is. When someone tells you, this is what the Bible says, this is what best practice is according to the Word of God, we have this big thing called desire that now counterbalances. It's really a dangerous place to be. Praying, if I can say one last thing on this point, when you have a strong desire, I do not ask you to rid yourself of the desire, if it's not sin. If it's a sinful desire, yeah, ask the Lord to get that out of your heart. But if it's a desire for something, all I ask is that you, you, you meet that desire with as much prayer as you have desire. As much time as you spend thinking about how neat or great it would be, meet it with, this is how much I'm going to pray about it. Right? <clears throat> Two. Verse 2, please. Well, you know, on that point, I was thinking about doing this later on, but let's look, look back at the very beginning of time. Genesis chapter 3, please. Genesis 3. The start of the story of desire is found in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3 and verse 6 says, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also <clears throat> unto her husband with her and he did eat. Again, there's no mention of prayer anywhere here. But she sees everything through her, through her eyes and through her instincts and through her desires. She sees it was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and it was desired to make one wise, which sounds like a good thing, but it wasn't because it was disobeying God. People have good intentions. You know, throughout all of Christendom, whatever it may be, whether any kind of church, from Episcopalian to Methodist to Baptist to Catholic to Mormon, Jehovah Witnesses, where people go wrong is when they introduce desire along with their faith. Get them away from prayer. Get them away from the clear things of God's word. So yeah, can you, can you meet a Jehovah Witness with the most wonderful desires? They want to serve God. They want to reach people with their gospel. Uh, but it's all for naught because they don't believe in sound doctrine. They can't tell you that Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life. They can't tell you that salvation starts and ends with Jesus Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Christ is the only way. And no works involved, right? No works involved. That's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
So that's true faith, Bible faith. But you'll meet the Jehovah Witness to stay on my example, and they'll say that, but then they'll say they've got all this kind of desire to serve people and do these works. It means nothing if it's not met with sound doctrine. Too bad. So do I, I guess I'm, I'm sorry, it's a long rabbit trail. Do I challenge the good intentions of, say, someone in the Mormon church? No. They might have great intentions. But great intentions don't cut it anywhere in Scripture. We need to find what are God's intentions. What are God's rules? What are God's ways? What is God's way of salvation? Of course, that's only in Christ. Anyways, you know the story there in Genesis. They take the fruit because they had a desire. Please go back to Proverbs chapter 18. 18 and verse 2. Only to jump off again here in a second, but Proverbs 18.2 says, A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. This is our world today. Everyone's trying to discover themselves. Have you heard those phrases? They're big in, like, in academia about self-discovery. Right? The journey towards self-discovery, towards self-awareness, towards self-love, towards self-acceptance. Um, again, there might be good intentions there, but it's completely not biblical. That if, you, if you look hard to try to discover yourself, you know what you will find or what you should find and what you need to find. You need to find that you're a sinner, dead in trespasses and sins. And once you discover that, and it's easy if you're honest, and if you're easy, if you're honest with Scripture, it's easy to see that we're sinners. And then once you know that fact, to dig any deeper is to become a Paul, Paul the Apostle, who the more he learned about himself, the more he didn't like, right? The world's completely contrary. The world's like, oh, you're going to keep, you're going to find your true self, and you're really going to love it, and then it's going to help you live better. That, ver that concept is found over in 2 Timothy. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. It's the same kind of desire mindset. <laughs> Trying to find your heart. We know the scriptures say that the heart is deceitful. Above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Bible tells us. 2 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> verse 1. My throat hurts a little bit. Hmm. Not... Not because I'm sick, I just think I talk too much. And you're like, yeah, we know. We know. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, I just ran at my work. I was busy running a, a uh, focus group. And if you're in a focus group trying to get people to talk, you have to do a lot of talking. 3, 1. Now, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, <clears throat> blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. I always call this one of the best, most accurate prophecies you see in Scripture, because this is what you see today. But it's that first line I draw your attention to. For men should be lovers of their own selves. The context here is <laughs> being a bad thing. Right? The context of people loving themselves is not helpful. But people discovering themselves is not helpful. I mean, I love everybody. And, you know, the counter-argument is here, well, Logan, some people get real depressed and they take their lives. And I know they do. I've had people close to me do that. I've, I've grown up with that happening around me. I know. But you know what the answer is not? For them to dig deep and discover themselves. Them to dig deep and love themselves. Because you know what they will find there is an empty solution. Absolutely. Absolutely. What you need to replace there is tell them, you need to discover God. Right? You need to love God. Discover the love He manifests in Jesus Christ, dying on the cross for our sins. That will stop the epidemic of, of people taking their lives, which really is getting bad. More and more lives are taken. And it's because of that worldly philosophy that you have something great inside of you that is everything you need. No, you don't. We lack. For all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Look at this. If you have that philosophy where you love yourself, or you're trying to discover yourself, you know what you discover? <clears throat> Look at verse 3. Without natural affection. That's the sodomy movement today. The LGBTQ movement. Absolutely it is. If you think that we are so wonderful that we can discover what, our, what we like, well, you know what we do? We start really going experimental with all of our desires. Well, what really do I desire? Well, that really didn't sad. That, I didn't find fulfillment in that. So I'll try the next thing. I'll try the next thing. Until pretty much the extent is men with men working that which is unseemly. Unnatural affection. Without natural affection. 
We see this story of people being discontent and people running their lives through desires. You can understand our world today. Yeah, we talk about Satan. Satan is a big part of our, the downfall of the world. But what did Satan use? Satan just played into Eve's desires. Then Eve's the one who ruined the situation. They had a wonderful world they had in the Garden of Eden. Look at that. False, <clears throat> truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good. Right? In a world filled with love, in a world filled with a unifying church, everybody coming together, you're Catholics, Mormons, Episcopalians, everybody's going to unite. We saw that in Revelation chapter 17. We'll see a little bit in 18. But when everybody unites in faith, you know who they will hate, who they will despise? Those who are good, those who believe the true gospel that says, actually, you know what? There's nothing good inside man. We cannot work our way to heaven. The Bible says, for all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. The Bible goes a long way to explain to us that you cannot work your way to heaven. The best things we do, all of our righteousness, are as filthy rags for a holy God. The Bible goes a long way to explain this. It's taken so much of mankind taking this Bible out of the common person's hand. Right? You know the history there. The, the devil has always tried to get the word of God confused or away from people. Back when the Catholic Church ruled the, ruled the world, more or less, and the Inquisition was going on, those were the days that absolutely, the Bible was, it literally was chained to the pulpit, and people couldn't take it and read it. The whole push to get a Bible out was so that the common, commoner, the plow boy, could read the Bible. What, is America, what do we see in America today? We see no interest in the Word of God. How many people in some of these new churches actually go to a church with a Bible in hand? Hardly any. They go in and they don't have it in their lap. They look at a PowerPoint and the PowerPoint has all of about three verses on it. And then they walk out and they don't have anything with them to take with them. Nothing gets down deep because anyways, the, what's on the screen is probably some really watered down translation. But they don't have answers. They don't have what a good church is. I, I challenge you on this. A good church is a church that encourages you to have this Bible and know this Bible really well. And you know why? So you can challenge me. And you can make sure that what I'm telling you isn't a lie. That's what I want you to do. I want, not even that. I want you to tell me, Logan, what you said is just wrong. Maybe I didn't lie on purpose. Say, Logan, that's not right because of this verse and this verse and this verse. You know what happens then? You have a powerful Bible-based church. But today, the people behind the pulpit don't know the Bible, and the people in the pews aren't challenging them. That's not how they pick churches. Today, people pick churches how? Well, I really like the coffee. Well, I really like the story. He told a story about a dog and a poodle, and that's the same thing, I guess. But then, and that's the best I can do on a story on the fly. That was a total fail, wasn't it, Donald? They're better at storytelling than I am. We cannot choose um, churches that way. This is what you have. And they, de they despise those that are good. Why despise a good church? Because churches like ours, I hope, is still preaching that Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life. And absolutely, there is sin that will absolutely damn you to hell that you absolutely cannot pay for yourself. And we even go a step further, the biblical step further, is to say, if you are trusting Christ because he's good, but then you got to do some things to get yourself there, then I tell you, you're not really trusting Christ. The analogy is, <laughs> if I have a chair up here, right? And I sit on the chair, but the chair looks rickety, so I'm like not really putting all my weight on the chair, okay? I'm like sitting like halfway. Do I trust the chair or do I trust my legs? I'm not trusting the chair. I'm not putting everything in it. Fully trusting Christ is just that. You give everything. All your stock. He graduated. Did he graduate that class already? Sometimes we have kids graduate out early. And that is cool. That's the parents love it when their kids graduate early. I'm joking. You see that verse over in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9? Would you look at that real fast for me? I quote it, but sometimes it's better just to see it for ourselves. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. If I had absolutely no background in the church, or I had no background in any church, and I went to the Word of God, and I looked through these verses, I would conclude that salvation is a free gift. It's by salvation, by grace through faith. Look at Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith. 
and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Those two verses, you know, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. It can't contradict itself. So when it says that, it gives us about three indications or more. I don't know how many to count there. Indications of this thing called salvation is not something that we have a hand in earning. The very fact that it says, well, let's read it again. For by grace, grace is unmerited favor. Unmerited, that means you didn't earn it, right? You didn't earn it. Unmerited favor, that means you didn't get baptized to earn it. You didn't join a church to join it. You didn't knock on doors to earn it. This is for by grace, are you saved through faith? Faith means you're saved by what? You know, Hebrews, the, Hebrews chapter 11 defines faith for us. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We're saved by grace, unmerited favor. We're saved by faith, which is something that, believing in something that you cannot see. Well, if you're saved by getting water baptized, you can see the water. If you're saved by joining a certain church, you can see the church. If you're saved by doing certain works, you can see the works, and other people see the works. You're not saved by those things. And then it goes on to say, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. As we understand salvation, as we teach it to our children, we explain it biblically as salvation being a gift. And I tell my kids, how often do you have to work for your birthday presents? You don't. It's a gift. Or if you work, then it's not a gift. That makes sense. I know I teach it, I teach it at first grade level. I read at that level too. It is a gift of God. <clears throat> not of works. We, any, any further evidence? Lest any man should boast. You could say, you say, Logan, Logan, that's one man's writing, that's Paul's writing in Ephesians. You're not getting the whole context of what's going on here. It's not just Paul's opinion, although Paul is inspired by God, but look over at John chapter 3. Through desire, people have taken salvation and they've thumbed their nose at it. John chapter 3. And how have people done this through desire? Because it is appealing to be a self-made man. It's appealing to build your own way, right? It's appealing. It is. That was, remember Cain, the man who killed Abel? Cain wanted to build his own sacrifice, his way. Didn't like God's way. He heard of God's way and he rejected it when, when Cain killed Abel, remember? God said, I want a blood sacrifice. Cain said, I want to go work the, on some more vegetables for you, and I want you to like it. That's what people do with their lives today. God, you told me what was right. You told me I needed the blood sacrifice, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty for my sins. But you know what? I wanted to do my own thing and make vegetables and prove to you that I was a pretty good person. Well, you know, at the end of the day, on the judgment seat, at the judgment seat of Christ, the great white throne judgment, I should say, you will stand there with your vegetables in hand, like Cain, and God will not be satisfied. No, nope. we learn in the book of Isaiah that only the travail of Christ's soul on the cross is the only thing that could satisfy God. Look at John chapter 3. If we wonder what salvation is, Jesus tells us again and again and again what this faith looks like and what he's going to accomplish. <clears throat> It's all good. You know John 3, 16, but let's read into it. Read into the analogy that Christ gives us about chapter 3 and verse... <clears throat> um, uh, look at verse 14 is all we need, really, I guess. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him and does a whole bunch of works on top of Christ, they will not perish. No, it doesn't. Right? Nothing about works in here in Christ's words. Whoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. I talk to Mormons all the time and I have a heart to reach Mormons because a lot of them are young, brought up in the church. You talk to them on the street corner. By the way, I just had a Mormon add me on Facebook for some reason. I'm not sure, but I'll try to share the gospel with them. But they will say, yeah, Christ is great. That's great, but that's not all there is to it. All there is to it. Well, what is there? More, they won't flat out say, but what is there? What there's to it is works, right? Works. Good works. Baptism, the Mormon church. 
it's contrary to what Scripture says. The, the analogy that Christ gives us is chapter 3 and verse 14. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Remember that? Brazen serpent in the wilderness. The children of Israel were going through the wilderness and they were getting um, bitten by poisonous serpents. Remember this story? Everybody remembers it? Poisoned, they are going to die quickly, and, but God gave a way to escape, and the way for those people to escape was to quickly run to the baptismal service, get dunked in the church, join that church, and then they would be able to keep on living. No, not at all. The Old Testament pattern was simply they got bit by the snake. They looked to the brazen serpent. Right? And they were healed. Look and live, as the song goes. That's called faith. They look in faith that that looking at something is going to save them, is going to heal them. And it did. And it's the same with Christ on the cross. Just looking at Christ, right? Believing that that will save you. That whole brazen serpent analogy is really quite profound. Didn't we study it in Sunday school? And we talked about why did, in the Old Testament, with the, in the wilderness, why did God tell Moses to make it a serpent, a brazen serpent on the pole? To look. Why? Serpent's an evil thing, isn't it? Well, you know what Christ took on at the cross? All of our evil sins. Right? Christ on the cross was such a hideous picture to God, God looked away. And Christ says, um, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's because he took your sins and my sins on the cross. He bore it all on the cross. We look and we live. We don't look and say, that's good, Christ, but, you know, i got to do my own thing and i got to help you out. Because all the nails in your hands and the, and the side being pierced and your back being ripped to shreds and all the blood you shed, it was good, but my church says that you've got to also do this and this and this and this. And they're pretty smart people. What they say really isn't found in Scripture, uh, but they're, they're pretty smart. I trust them. No. Man-made religions really destroy things. They really destroy things. After the traditions of men, the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. Let's go back. Let's go back to our Proverbs. That was a, that was a um, topic on desire and how it destroys salvation. Please look at Proverbs 18 and verse... I'm not going to do this for every verse. In fact, I think I'm pretty much, uh, pretty much done with the jump-offs. Uh, for, for this point. Look at uh, verse 3. <clears throat> when the wicked cometh, Proverbs 18, 3, when the wicked cometh, then cometh also contempt. And with ignominy, that word always gives me problems, reproach. Contempt means uh, mean opinion, disdain, hatred. With wicked hearts that don't love the Lord come those things, a mean opinion, disdain, hatred, uncalled for altogether. It also says with ignominy, reproach. Ignominy means public shame, disgrace. And when someone's getting public shame or disgrace, the result is reproach. It's a, it's a blame. It's a charge against. When the wicked don't get right, you know what happens? Uh, they despise those that are good, and they speak against them. And for no good reason, they'll call you, you a cult. You know, I've had people who are a cult call me a cult. And what is a cult? Truly what a cult is, is someone who adds works to Jesus Christ. Who adds words to Jesus Christ's words. Those are cults. Because they have made themselves a man, a religion, right? Truly, those are the cults, the ones who add words to Christ, add books to the Bible, take away passages they don't like. Jehovah Witness, I don't want to pick on anybody, but Jehovah Witnesses are really good at this. They, they wrote their whole Bible just to try to prove their own doctrine, <laughs> when we should get all of our doctrine by the Bible, right? But we speak against them, and then they, they say, that, no, we're just trying to stay on the Word of God, and that's what Christians have got to do. I challenge anyone, just like I've said tonight, if you uh, want to talk about what, what salvation is, we have enough right here for you and I to both sit down and figure it out between you and I. Don't need any Greek expert, Hebrew expert. We have the Word of God preserved for us. Look at verse 4, please. The words of a man's mouth are as deep waters and the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. It is not good to accept the person of the wicked to overthrow the righteous in judgment. I'll read through some of these a little quicker. Six, a fool's lip enter into contention, and his mouth calleth for strokes. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. 
The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down to the innermost parts of the belly. He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Verses 10 and 11 will get us again to our topic in Revelation, so I want to get there. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. The rich man's wealth is his strong city, and as in high wall in his own conceit. We talked about that two weeks ago, or I guess last week. Don't make wealth your strong tower, your strong city. It will not last. Christ is the only safe haven for us. 12. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. You know what it takes to get right on anything, including on salvation. You know what it takes to get right? Humility. You have to finally admit that, well, I believed this my whole life. Now you're telling me it's wrong? Sometimes that happens. I've had many moments like that in my life. Well, I've always believed it this way. Well, there's two options when you're, hit with, when you're hit with the truth. You can accept it or reject it. It says, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. You can either get disgruntled because someone's confronted with you with something that counters what you've always believed. You can get mad about it. You can get upset about it. You can hate the messenger. But what good does it do you if, if what the messenger said is true? No good. Before honor is humility. When you hear truth presented... Be humble. Be humble. Don't do what I often do. Many times, you know what we do when we're confronted with truth? Real truth, and it's, it's proven right before our eyes that the Bible says this, right? Don't do what I have done in the past and probably still prone to do. Don't see the truth, but then push the truth over here and start targeting the speaker instead. Well, the problem with that speaker is he's wrong on this. He's also wrong on this over here. Right? And this is wrong over here. What am I doing? I'm just switching what I know is true. I'm going to put the focus over here. Don't do that when you're confronted with truth. Especially if you, if you think God's talking about something tonight. Please don't look at my life to make a decision over truth. Because you'll find problems with my life. You will. But if we've said something that's true, just take that. Take that. And wrestle with that. Wrestle all night with that. God will bless you for it. You'll find the right answer. But we're all, we can all be deceitful, can't we? And not really argue about what really challenged us during a sermon or a Bible lesson or even our own Bible reading. What really challenged us, we say, no, actually there's this other thing that's important. My dad used to tell a joke. He, he's a pastor too. But he used to say, we'd be witnessing to someone real, you know, strong, praying about witnessing somebody. And they would change the topic to like the most silly things he'd say. Oh, look at that little bug over there. And they walk over and talk about the bug. Or, look at that little crack in the floor. They walk over there. And sometimes we do that our, on our own. When we know there's a truth, a truth that's challenging us, let's think about something else. Don't do that. We'll never grow in wisdom. And you'll never get saved if we always do that when we're challenged with what true salvation is. Look at 14, please. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear? The heart of the prudent getteth knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeketh knowledge. Yeah, we want. You know, I, I can say this completely honestly. I want someone to challenge me on doctrines. I want it. Not because I want to, like, have a victory and get some bragging points. I want people to challenge me because whenever someone challenges you, it, it gives you a chance to sharpen, right? You either, you either sharpen up your argument, you'll firm it even firmer, or they'll win the day and they'll convince you on what you should believe. I love it. I even love questions. I, I mean, sometimes a foolish question can be brought up that's not helpful during a Bible study and stuff, but, but like one-on-one -on -one questions and downstairs, people say, well, why did you believe that? I love it. Don't, please don't ever stop back from, if there's a question, that, or if you see a passage in Scripture and you're like, you know, that says that, but I hear the pastor say this on Sundays, and how do those things jive? Please ask me about it. Please ask me about it. It'll, it'll either be good for me, or good for you, or good for both of us. Absolutely will be. Okay. I'm talking all kinds of places all over the map. I'm sorry. Now you understand why my voice is gone. Please look at um, 16. A man's gift maketh room for him, and bringeth him before great men. He who is first in his own cause seemeth just, but his neighbor cometh and searcheth him. The lot causeth contentions to cease and parteth between the mighty. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. Yeah, it's, a, it's bad when you offend a true brother in the Lord. We try to avoid that. 
by following the biblical pattern we talked about Sunday night. 20. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. I completely believe that. Death and life. You listen to a bunch of lies, it can absolutely push you down the wrong path, just like Adam and Eve following Satan's lies. You listen to truth, though, and you find truth presented to you, honest truth, then it can absolutely mean life. Life. You found salvation. You found that your conception of salvation has been wrong all along because it wasn't Christ and Christ alone. You found life. And then I love the fact, too, if you have kids, if you're not sure of your salvation, make sure of it tonight because you know what? You've got a bunch of little kids looking at you. Isn't that important, folks? Right? I don't know. I am born again. I've been born again for a long time, but raising kids is hard. If I didn't have the Lord, boy. If I couldn't give them what the true answer for salvation is, boy. I'd hate to tell my kids, well, you know what? This is what I think salvation is. You've got to kind of do this and this and this, and then you just kind of hope for the best. You know everything outside of what I said tonight is that? You know that? I challenge, that's something where I challenge them. Well, my my in-laws are, 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 are Catholic, wonderful folks. Um, but I always challenge them with that. And I other people I challenge as well. But if you, if you die today, would you go to heaven or not? I can say... Just like um, the Bible tells us, I am confident, willing rather, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I am confident that when I close my eyes, I will open my eyes in front of my Savior. What is it? First John, um, what's that verse? Five, yeah, that you can know that you have eternal life. Look at that. Show, where's that? First John 5, what, Brett? First John 5, 7. Or, let's take a look. I know it's back there somewhere. It's right by channel 19, right after ESPN. First John 5, 13. Thank you. Yep, that's it. Look at that. First John 5, 13. Challenge some of your um, friends who believe in a some sort of work salvation with this verse. First John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. It says you can know that you have eternal life. You know how you can know that? Because you're only trusting in what Christ did. And when Christ said the job was finished, He meant it. If you, don't believe, if you believe Christ plus something else, until the day you die, you will never be firmly confident that you're going to go to heaven. Because it's about you, right? If you trust in yourself for anything, you know uh, not a lot. You can't put a lot of stock there, right? If you just trust in Christ as your Savior, as everyone in Scripture did. Remember the Philippian jailer? He asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, period. Remember the thief on the cross with Christ? He said, remember me when thou goest to the kingdom. And Jesus said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. I've talked to people who believe in baptism to save, right? Or sprinkling to save. And I said, That guy didn't get baptized. That guy didn't join any church. He simply believed in Christ. And Christ said, Yeah, you're, you're, <laughs> today you'll be with me in paradise. The Bible is it's an open and shut case what salvation is. Only the devil can confuse these things. And he's done a wonderful job. But you can know you're saved. And I trust that you do or you will make sure of it soon. Let's look at Revelation while we're back here. We'll just jump straight there. Revelation 18. In the book of Revelation, we kind of, we get what we get. Uh, sometimes we get more questions than answers. <laughs> you know what I've already said. I love all books of the Bible, but I'm a simple man, so I like the simple books. Uh, Revelation's got some deep truths that have even been elusive you know, to the greatest theologians and scholars over time. So there's some deep stuff here. So let's just try to get some major themes out of Revelation 18. And if you have any questions, just mail them to Donald at his mailing address. We'll put it at the bottom of the screen, and he will cover those. Uh, Revelation 18 and verse 1. What we see here in 18 is this story again about Babylon. We saw it in 17. Remember, 17, though, is the real 
Um, the, the heart of the matter in 17 is spiritual Babylon. It talked about all these peoples of all these lands across all the waters, right? They're all coming together as one church. Remember 17 verse 5 said, And upon her forehead was, was the name written, Mystery Babylon, the great and the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. This is a picture in 17 of that spiritual Babylon. And really, if you study, if you remember last week, it talked about all the churches coming together. All the churches, remember verse 9, and it says, And here is the mind which hath, mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman, woman sitteth. Those who study their Bibles closely, they believe that this Babylon talked about in Revelation is centered in Rome. And what religion is centered in Rome? Vatican, right? That Roman Catholicism. And so many people take the position that the churches come together, but who is still in, at the head of these churches? The Pope, right? Still very powerful. It's still across all kinds of oceans and waters and lands. But you see all the way our churches are going. Aren't all of our churches getting more and more similar? I mean, just your church on this corner, they're all preaching the same thing. They're all just preaching Jesus loves you, accept everything, sin's not so bad, hell's not real, and, you know, work hard and you'll find your way there. All the churches could really have a service together today. And they do. Okay. But that's what we saw in 17. In 18, you see the power of this spiritual conglomeration, the spiritual federation of churches. And it even impacts commercial things. Let's look at, let's get reading or I'll run out of time. 18.1. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. I believe that might, remember in, in chapter 16, all the lights went out with that fifth bold judgment. God turned, God makes the earth dark. It might be this angel brings some light back to earth. I'm not sure. Look at two. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. I don't have much time, but look at that, would you, real quick? Who talked about Christendom, the realm of profession, and how it's all filled with birds? Who talked about that? Christ. Look at that real quickly with me, would you, please? Um, no, Matthew 13, 31. Matthew 13, 31. We've only got about 12 minutes. A desire. A desire right now for Christians is what? Everyone come together and sing Kumbaya and have a wonderful unity in our world. Isn't it? It's a desire, but it's not a biblical desire. Because what fellowship hath light with darkness? Right? Look at Matthew 13 and verse 31. It says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. When Christ talks about tares among the wheat, remember the big wheat field, you see that in the parable before, and then the birds and the trees, he's talking about all this thing called Christianity, right? Or believers. We says as time goes on, all the realm of believers gets filled with a lot of people who don't really know the Lord, right? They say, Lord, Lord, but Jesus Christ at the end times would say, depart from me for I never knew you, you that work iniquity. That's the truth about Christianity today. It's filled with so many people that don't truly know the Lord in so many different churches. Okay, well, let's go back to our text now. This Babylon, it talks about fallen, but it's filled with all these hateful birds. <laughs> Look at verse uh, 3 now, please. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. This whore of Babylon that talks about in Scripture, it mixes with everyday life. The pursuit of riches, the pursuit of the merchants go right in line with these churches today. I'm sorry you see this. Churches are being run as businesses with business models, right? And they, they mesh well with, with people trying to make money. Verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partaker of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. 
Throughout Scripture, you see in Paul's writing and others, you see that the Bible way is to come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. That's why you cannot have unity, right? Light and darkness do not have fellowship. They cannot have fellowship. The only way to do that is for you to become darker. Five, and for her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. I believe this could be speaking particularly of the, the believers during the tribulation period, the tribulation saints, how they, are, they should not compromise with Babylon during this time, with the world system. But I also think it preaches a, a bigger lesson to us today, to come out from some of these um, unifying desires. Instead say, we're going to preach as Christ preached. And Christ wasn't a unifying figure. Actually, he caused division with the message he brought. Okay, look at verse 6, please. Reward her even as she rewardeth you, and double unto her double according to her works, and the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double, for how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and no, no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. This commercial Babylon is going to come to a quick close. What this, when scholars look at it, they believe this is like a downfall of the world's economies. Like a huge collapse of all the banking systems in the marketplace, we know the stock market. Everything comes to a sudden crash during the tribulation period. That's what many believe it's pointing to. Sudden crash in one day. And watch this reaction here. Look at verse uh, uh, 9, please. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Yeah, now these kings are sad about this fall of commercial Babylon because this is where all their wealth was at. But remember in the last chapter, they, they were rejoicing about the collapse of the spiritual Babylon. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thion wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of most precious wood, vessels of most precious wood, and of brass and iron and marble. All these precious commodities, all this riches, things that people desire, comes to a sudden halt. And cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses, chariots and slaves and souls of men. You know we talk about human trafficking a lot. That verse kind of alludes to that a little bit. That in this merchandise are also slaves and souls of men. Yeah, human trafficking is a thing. It's absolutely abominable. But to finally stop here, 14 and the fruits of thy soul and the fruits of thy soul lusted after are departed from thee and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee and thou shalt find them no more at all the merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment weeping and wailing there's a great destruction on this system and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed with fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so great riches has come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company and the ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein we made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her coast signs for in one hour is she made desolate the bible devotes like a whole chapter in 18 to looking at how people are finally going to lose all these riches and treasures and wealth and possessions it comes to an end here it shows you the power of what pushes people isn't it people waste their lives chasing after things that pass away and here god makes a point of i'm just going to shut it all down at one fell swoop it's amazing. It shows you what desire can do. People choose their desires, treasures on this earth, not treasure in heaven. Let's finish it out. I'm, I'm not commenting much. I'm sorry because I, I use the time in other topics. 20. Rejoice over her, thou heaven. Oh, I should say this, though. 
the kings, the earth, the rich people, they're crying over this commercial Babylon falling because it was their God. It's what they loved. Look at the view from heaven. Whenever you read Revelation, think about whenever it talks about heaven. In heaven, they're rejoicing through the book of Revelation. It shows in heaven, they get the picture that wicked is wicked and God is holy. And they rejoice over some of these things. 20, rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like great millstone and cast into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. I think this is speaking of the, more of the system Babylon. But back there in verse 9, the reason they think that this towels are seated in the Vatican and in Rome is because it talks about the seven hills, seven hills that the Vatican are on. Look here at verse 22. And the voices of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpets shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman or whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. It's done. And the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. The deception of riches. 24. In her was found the blood of prophets and of saints, and of all that were slain upon the earth. You say, what's wrong with some riches and possessions? Well, they are wrong in themselves. But the truth is, this Babylon, this whore of Babylon, is also causing the death of the saints. We see that. The killing of Christians during the tribulation period. And that's a big part of why heaven is rejoicing when God is finally saying, enough is enough. Wickedness, lies, deceitfulness of riches, it's finally overthrown in Revelation 18. In Revelation 19, if you join us next week, we're talking about the marriage of the Lamb. It's a whole kind of different topic, but we're pushing right towards the end of time. Um, important chapters coming up to understand, or at least to have some handle on. We've got one minute. Any complaints, questions, anybody want their money back because we can give full refunds? Call the number at the bottom of your screen, right, Donald? Well, thanks for joining us. I know the second half in Revelation gets pretty, uh, uh, what do you call Revelation? It's not meant to uh, make, give you joy, right, Leah? But it's there for something. All right. Levi likes it. He's the only one that likes this class. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for being here. Let's pray. And I, before I pray, I just say, if you have questions about what we cover salvation, I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to get that um, figured out. The Bible says, no man knoweth what a day may bring forth. I always encourage people, if you don't know that you're saved, like I said in 1 John 5, 13, um, then make sure you know. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the Word of God, how clear it is, at least on the gospel front, Lord, that there are no questions there. It's not like the book of Revelation where we're trying to guess what might happen in the future. But Lord, the gospel is clear, so clear that a child um, can understand it, Lord. In fact, you tell us that we should have faith like a child and simply believe in the things that we hear in the Word of God. I pray that would be the heart of everybody sitting here tonight, every last person sitting here, that they would simply in faith trust Christ as their Savior. I pray that be the prayer request that we've named, the people who couldn't join us tonight. I pray that you guide them and bless them in their lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.